Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to receive testimony on the global threats facing the United States and our international partners. I would like to welcome our witnesses, Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, and Director of Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Jeffrey Cruz. I would take a moment to recognize that this is General Cruz's first posture hearing before the committee. Thank you both for joining us, and please convey the committee's gratitude to the men and women of the intelligence community for their critical work. Over the past several months, this committee has received testimony from nearly every military department, armed service, and combatant command about the threats they face. As they have testified, and as the DNI's annual threat assessment has made clear, these challenges are evolving quickly. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea seek to undermine, if not outright challenge, the United States' interest and leadership in the world. I am encouraged that many of these threats are addressed in part by the National Security Supplemental that Congress passed two weeks ago. This bill was long overdue, but we cannot overstate its importance. Even in our most conflicted moments, the world looks to the United States for leadership. Our allies rely on us for fortitude, and our adversaries hope for us to falter. By finally passing the National Security Supplemental, Congress sent a powerful message to the world. The legislation demonstrates that we stand with resolutely with our allies and partners, and that America's interests and safety won't be challenged by dictators or bullies. For the Ukrainians, the bill would provide critical weapons, ammunition, and combat vehicles to revitalize their heroic fight for freedom. Vladimir Putin must be stopped, both for the sake of Ukraine's survival and the security of all Americans. As the annual threat assessment warns, Putin has repeatedly said that if he succeeds in Ukraine, he intends to, quote, reunify other former Soviet states. This will almost certainly involve direct military conflict with a NATO country requiring the United States to send our own men and women into harm's way. Director Haynes, General Cruz, I would ask for your assessment of the Ukraine conflict in the larger context of the evolving international order. I hope you will also address the extent to which Russian and Chinese efforts are aligning under their so-called No Limits Partnership and potential implications for U.S. national security. As we know, China is watching us closely, and the supplemental aid package will serve as an important deterrent to President Xi's aggressive ambitions in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. For several decades, the People's Liberation Army has studied the United States' way of war and focused its efforts on countering our advantages. China has invested in offsetting technologies like anti-access and area denial systems, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, and of course, nuclear weapons. Further, China has leveraged a combination of military and civil power against its neighbors, including statecraft, economic pressure, coercion, and deception. Beijing has sought ways to achieve its national objectives while avoiding a direct confrontation with the United States military. Just as Chinese leaders have studied our way of war, we need to study theirs. With that in mind, I would ask our witnesses for their assessment of how China is evolving its competitive strategies and objectives. I would also appreciate an update on what military and non-military factors are most likely to impact Chinese decision-making with respect to potential coercive actions against Taiwan and other regional partners. Finally, in the Middle East, I'm concerned that we face a uniquely dangerous moment. With Israel and Hamas engaged in a violent conflict in Gaza, Iran is seeking to exploit the chaos as an opportunity to force the United States out of the region. Iran appears to have calculated that the best strategy to achieve this is by directing its proxy forces to attack American, Israeli, and allied interests in the Middle East. The Iranian-linked Houthi rebels in Yemen have launched hundreds of drones and missile attacks against U.S. and international vessels in the Red Sea and even further, disrupting nearly 15 percent of global commercial trade driving up costs and inflation around the world. The National Security Supplemental will equip U.S. forces with the resources they need to protect our service members in international shipping lanes and will help Israel defend itself from vicious attacks from Iran, Hamas, and other violent groups. Just as importantly, it will provide critical humanitarian aid to Palestinians caught in the crossfire. 
I would appreciate our witnesses' perspectives on these complex challenges. Thank you again to our witnesses. I look forward to your testimony. As a reminder for my colleagues, there will be a closed session immediately following this hearing in room SVC 217. Let me now turn to Ranking Member Worker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is a chance for the committee to hear the intelligence community's assessment of the many threats that our uh, country faces. I regularly hear from our nation's top uniformed and civilian personnel. Their testimony makes it clear to me that the United States faces a troubling threat environment and that the situation urgently requires American leadership. Armed conflict is raging in multiple theaters. Regional instability is on the rise. Violent Islamic terrorism is expanding. Several of our principal adversaries are deepening their cooperation, forming a new axis of evil and striving to reshape the geopolitical order. We have reached a pivotal moment in history. The decisions we make this year will have far-reaching implications for our national security. It is disturbing to me that the intelligence community seems unable to give our national security officials or the American public an answer about the size of the Chinese defense budget. That said, we do know that our principal adversary, Communist China, has announced, has announced another 7.2% increase to its defense budget for 2024. I would like our witnesses to articulate a plan for how they will answer this question, a plan that involves more than one full-time analyst working on the problem, as is currently the case. No matter the exact size of the Chinese budget, we see with our own eyes, in public and in classified settings, the scope and scale of the Chinese military modernization. If we hope to maintain deterrence or win a fight, we will need the military and the intelligence community to work more closely together than they ever have. To that end, I would like to understand what specific policies the intelligence community has changed to enable a more effective targeting process for the military. Beijing is leading that increasingly integrated axis of countries bent on undermining United States interest. This new alignment of cooperation among China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea is a greater menace than we have faced in decades. I do not believe the American people have a sufficient understanding of the danger. Many of us do not know the ways in which these adversaries are working together to make Americans, our allies, and our partners less safe. I hope our witnesses can comment with specific examples about this new threat. The National Security Supplemental Congress passed last, um, but supplemental that Congress passed last week is an important and historic step in the right direction, as the chairman just stated. It was necessary, but it is insufficient. We have much more work to do to restore our industrial base to a wartime footing to strengthen our allies and to get innovative technologies into the hands of our service members. We do all of this because we hope to prevent a war from ever coming to pass. So I thank our witnesses for their service to the country and for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Worker. Uh, Director Haynes, please. Thank you very much, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here alongside my wonderful colleague, General Cruz, the Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, to present the IC's annual threat assessment. Before I start, I want to thank publicly the people of the intelligence community, from the collector to the analyst and everybody in between. We are presenting the result of their labor at this hearing. They work tirelessly every day to support our military, to keep our country safe and prosperous, and we are proud to represent them. Today, the United States faces an increasingly complex and interconnected threat environment characterized by really three categories of challenges. The first is an accelerating strategic competition with major authoritarian powers that are actively working to undermine the rules-based order and the open international system, which the United States and our partners rely on for trade, for commerce, and for the free flow of information. 
And the second category is a set of more intense and unpredictable transnational challenges, such as cybersecurity, terrorism, climate change, narcotics trafficking, and health security that often interact with traditional state-based political, economic, and security challenges. And the third category is made up of regional and localized tensions, including those that have erupted into full-blown conflicts, with far-reaching and at times cascading implications, not just for neighboring countries, but globally. And all three categories are affected by trends in new and emerging technologies, environmental changes, and economic strain that is stoking instability, making it that much more challenging for us to forecast developments and their implications. And the report we have issued goes through the threats we see in all three categories as they intersect with these key trends, giving you a sense of the IC's baseline assessments of the most pressing threats to US national interests. But rather than attempt to summarize the report here, I'll just touch on some of the issues that I know are top of mind, starting with the PRC's outlook this year, then provide a brief update on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the conflict in Gaza, and the scale and scope of cyber attacks that we're currently monitoring. With respect to the PRC, President Xi and his senior leadership expect some degree of future instability in the bilateral relationship with the United States, and they continue to believe that the United States is committed to containing China's rise and undermining the party's rule, but they also perceive value in projecting stability in the relationship this year, particularly from a domestic economic perspective, which is their main priority. We assess that the PRC's leadership recognizes the productivity, debt, demographic, demand challenges that China's economy is facing. But rather than looking to stimulate consumer spending or adopting more investment-friendly approaches, President Xi appears to be doubling down on a long-term growth strategy powered by manufacturing strength and technological innovations that will almost certainly deepen public and investor pessimism over the near term. And President Xi is counting on China's investments in technologies such as advanced manufacturing and robotics, artificial intelligence, and the high-performance computing to drive productivity, productivity gains and spur growth in the future. Yet he is increasingly concerned about the United States' ability to interfere with China's technological goals. Consequently, PRC leaders modified their approach to economic retaliation against the United States over the last year, imposing at least some tangible costs on US firms. And we remain of the view, though, that in the coming months, they are likely to limit the level of economic retaliation they engage in in order to avoid the domestic costs of such actions. In particular, the significant decline in foreign direct investment in China down 77.5% in 2023, is likely to prompt the PRC to be more measured in their responses absent an unexpected escalation by the United States. And rather than engaging in direct economic retaliation that might result in such negative domestic economic consequences, the PRC's tactics are evolving to promote an increasingly sophisticated exploitation of loopholes, avoid detection, engage in stockpiling. Moreover, the PRC also remains focused on achieving its regional and global ambitions, which warrants from their leadership's perspective a strategy that boosts China's indigenous innovation and technological self-reliance, supports efforts to acquire, steal, or compel the production of intellectual property and capabilities, and controls critical global supply chains that provide the leverage to achieve certain geopolitical outcomes to their advantage. And furthermore, given its ambitions, Beijing will continue to use its military forces to intimidate its neighbors and to shape the region's actions in accordance with the PRC's priorities, most obviously in relation to Taiwan as the PRC presses for unification. And we expect the PLA will field more advanced platforms, deploy new technologies, grow more competent in joint operations, and seek to strengthen their nuclear forces and cyber capabilities while also seeking to divide us from our allies in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. In the meantime, China is working to develop its own form of multilateralism while deepening its relationship with Russia and Iran in particular. In fact, China's provision of dual-use components and material to Russia's defense industry is one of several factors that tilted the momentum on the battlefield in Ukraine in Moscow's favor, while also accelerating a reconstitution of Russia's military strength after their extraordinarily costly invasion. And when it comes to Ukraine, we assess that President Putin thinks that domestic and international trends are in his favor. Russia is making incremental progress on the battlefield with the potential for tactical breakthroughs along the front lines in areas such as Donetsk and Kharkiv. 
And publicly, Putin touts his ammunition and missile production capacity in contrast with what he portrays as significant US, European, and Ukrainian limitations. He likely views his position based on Russia's economic trajectory, rearmament efforts, and his political staying power as advantageous compared with the challenges facing the Ukrainians, including the hard fight here and in Europe for continued support for Ukraine. Like Ukraine, Putin has for months indicated a willingness to enter into talks with Ukraine and the United States about the future for Ukraine, but without any indication that he is willing to make significant concessions. Putin's increasingly aggressive tactics against Ukraine, such as the strikes on Ukraine's electricity infrastructure, are intended to impress on Ukraine that continuing to fight will only increase the damage to Ukraine and offer no plausible path to victory. By targeting critical infrastructure, Moscow aims to create logistical hurdles that impede Ukraine's ability to move forces and supplies to the front, slow Ukrainian defense production, and build pressure for Kyiv to consider pathways out of the war, including through negotiations. And these aggressive tactics are likely to continue, and the war is unlikely to end anytime soon. In fact, in a major change in fiscal policy, President Putin has increased defense spending to almost 7% of Russia's GDP, nearly double the historical average. The defense budget now accounts for roughly 25% of federal spending in Russia. And in many ways, this is prompted by the fact that Russia has paid an enormous price for the war in Ukraine. Not only has Russia spent hundreds of billions of dollars, suffered more than military losses than in any time since World War II, with more than 300,000 casualties, but the war precipitated Finland's and Sweden's membership in NATO, which Putin believes requires an expansion of Russia's ground forces. And Putin continues to judge that Russia is under threat and almost certainly assumes that a larger, better equipped military will drive that point home to Western and domestic audiences. Putin's strategic goals also remain unchanged. He continues to see NATO enlargement and Western support to Ukraine as reinforcing his long-held belief that the United States and Europe seek to restrict Russian power. In turn, he has tried to capitalize on global events, such as the outbreak of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, to divide us from our allies. And the crisis in Gaza is another striking example of how a localized conflict can produce global impact. Nearly seven months in, the Gaza conflict has roiled the Middle East, presenting new security paradigms and humanitarian challenges while pulling in a range of actors. Most prominently, there was the unprecedented level of attacks between Iran and Israel, with Iran and its proxies launching hundreds of weapons towards Israel in response to Israel's killing of Iranian officials in Damascus. And additionally, cross-border attacks along Israel's northern border with Lebanon continue at a pace and intensity that is controlled, but has the potential to escalate, even as we continue to assess that Hezbollah does not want the situation to develop into an all-out war with Israel and the United States. And as of last week, the Houthis resume nearly daily maritime attacks after announcing last month that they intend to escalate strikes and expand their hostile actions to the Indian Ocean. Meanwhile, Iranian-aligned militia groups in the region continue to plan attacks against our forces, but have broadly paused conducting such attacks, though it is not clear how long that pause will last. Moreover, the crisis has galvanized violence by a range of actors around the world. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS, inspired by Hamas, have directed supporters to conduct attacks against Israel and U.S. interests, demonstrating yet again the degree to which so many threat streams have system effects. Finally, I'll just end by talking about the increasing challenge associated with one of our most pernicious transnational threats, cyber attacks. We have seen a massive increase in the number of ransomware attacks globally in the last year, which went up as much as 74% in 2023. US entities were the most heavily targeted, with attacks against the healthcare sector roughly doubling what they had been the year before. And moreover, this year, cyber actors are attacking US industrial control systems, which are typically used to automate industrial processes at record levels. Many critical infrastructure sectors, including water and wastewater, food and agriculture, defense, energy, and transportation rely on such systems. And although the likelihood of any single attack having a widespread effect on interrupting critical services remains low, 
the increased number of attacks and the actor's willingness to access and manipulate these control systems increases the collective odds that at least one could have a more significant impact. And in virtually all of the attacks we've seen against US critical infrastructure, cyber actors took advantage of default or weak passwords, unpatched known vulnerabilities, and poorly secured network connections to launch relatively simple attacks. And for this reason, it is crucial that all of us, particularly critical infrastructure owners and operators, improve our cybersecurity practices to reduce our, our vulnerability to such efforts. State actors can, of course, use more sophisticated capabilities to more reliably cause greater disruptions by breaching better defended targets, resulting in, for example, multiple failures at once. State actors, however, also tend to recognize their own vulnerabilities and are unlikely to engage in attacks on critical infrastructure unless they are at war. Instead, these actors put a premium on preparing offensive capability basically during peacetime, in part by preemptively planting footholds in our infrastructure. And what is often the case, particularly in the context of ransomware attacks, is that we are dealing with unaffiliated cyber actors focused on obtaining money, power, or hacktivists who seek notoriety for specific causes. And there are, of course, so many threats and scenarios that I haven't covered to, in my opening remarks, but I hope we can do so when we get to your questions. And most of all, thank you for your support for the intelligence community's work and also for the work on 702 reauthorization. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, General Cruz, please. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to join Director Haynes in presenting our assessment of the global security environment. I'd like to streamline my opening comments this morning first by echoing the DNI's overall assessments in her remarks, as well as her thanks to the men and women of the intelligence community. The Defense Intelligence Agency alone has officers in more than 140 nations around the globe, and we are joined by thousands more from across the 18 members of the IC. And with your support, they are world class in their commitment and their results. And it's a privilege to represent them and their work before the committee. The national security arena's complexity, trajectory, and rate of change is perhaps the highest and most consequential we've seen in several decades. How we respond matters, and our level of innovation, focus, and integration must equal or outpace that of our adversaries. In this vein, I would offer three overarching themes beyond what the DNI has already mentioned that are the most concerning to me as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. First is that while individually threats are growing, whether specific countries or rapid growth in malign use of advanced technology, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, unmanned systems, or cyber, there are a growing number of adversaries who are interacting and partnering in ways and toward ends that we have not seen before. Historical friction points are no longer governing their relationships, and the new resulting partnerships are still nascent and untested meaning how we predict and shape their trajectory is nascent and untested as well. Second, while much of our collection, our analysis, our modernization, and our engagements are laser focused on near and midterm issues and impacts in Ukraine, the Indo-Pacific, and the Middle East, the long-term trajectory in these regions and the impacts on the United States are equally troubling and perhaps even more far reaching. For example, how events in Ukraine play out in the months ahead will be critical and will impact how Russia emerges postured and emboldened for potential future conflict with its neighbors, including NATO. Similarly, the Chinese Communist Party's national and military plans are not solely focused on Taiwan and the South China Sea in the 2020s, but also on securing an entirely new place for the People's Republic of China throughout the 2030s and the 2040s. These ambitions and their associated military, space, cyber, and nuclear expansion to entice or compel outcomes are at the expense of their neighbors, the region, the United States, and the open international system. And in the Middle East, as mentioned, how the current conflict between Hamas and Israel is resolved is likely to determine regional dynamics for decades. Consequently, how we view and adequately prepare for these longer-term outcomes is a near-term issue with near-term actions required. And then finally, the third issue is our unquestionable need to protect our networks, our data, and our people from the pervasive threat of cyber actors, foreign intelligence entities, and insider threats. 
This includes not only the sophisticated capabilities of state actors, such as Russia and China, but also rogue cyber actors loosely aligned to governments. In addition to what Director Haynes has already stated on the growing threat to critical infrastructure in, in local governments, this threat directly endangers our defense industrial capabilities, our hard-won technological and military advantages, our allies and partners, and our future defense operations. We must partner, invest, and integrate in new ways to, to secure what we value and safeguard the assured resiliency of our networks, the data, and the people. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. We are grateful for the committee's longstanding partnership and support, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General, uh, for both uh, the director and the general. Um, the intelligence community, I believe, and correct me if I'm inaccurate, uh, concluded that Iran was not aware prior to the attack by Hamas of the operation, but they seem to be exploiting it uh, significantly and um, by using their proxies throughout the region. And as you pointed out, uh, Director uh, Haynes, uh, our retaliation in September, uh, 82 different uh, strikes, has for the moment uh, inhibited many of their proxies. Uh, still, the Houthis are conducting operations. Um, can you give me a, an assessment of the Iranian strategy? Uh, it, is it uh, reactive or proactive? Are they trying to organize you know, a decisive uh, victory, or are they simply reacting to what's going on or t trying to take advantage of what's going on? Thank you so much, Chairman. I, I think um, really it's a combination of all of those things, which is to say that uh, even though we don't assess that they were aware of the particular attack at the moment that it occurred in the way that it did, they obviously have been supportive of Hamas in the past, have provided funding and training and uh, other uh, assistance of different types. And, and the reality is that um, in many ways they support efforts to counter Israel as we've seen. They see Israel as their enemy and they have long done so. And uh, and so as things have um, developed, I think they're taking advantage of every opportunity to ultimately um, try to undermine the state of Israel in many respects. So it, that is certainly part of what they're doing. It is also, I think, true that they're looking to take advantage of opportunities to enhance their influence in the region. That is something that, again, they have long uh, worked on, you know, whether it's through the um, Iranian-aligned militia groups that we're all aware of in the region or through their relationship with the Houthis or through their relationship with Hamas and, of course, one of their closest partners, Hezbollah. And, uh, and so in supporting them and in also increasing their influence, there is a kind of a long-term strategy of trying to enhance that, including in countries like Iraq and so on. And so I think that's a fair, but I, General Cruz may have General more to Cruz? add. I think I would just echo a couple of things that the DNI mentioned. One is that they have had a long-term strategy uh, over many decades, and they have been long-term suppliers and supporters of the groups already mentioned. Um, within that larger strategy, this conflict came into being, and they've used every opportunity uh, to take advantage of the circumstances. I wouldn't call it necessarily reactive, but the ability to, within their larger construct, increase their influence and come out. Um, at some point, this conflict will end. Uh, Iran has gone through a various sets of calculus over time about escalating escalation or not escalating, and I think they're navigating a path by which they think they can create um, uh, more influence within the region for the longer term uh, uh, environment that we'll find at the end of the existing conflict. Uh, in uh, looking at China, you mentioned, uh, Director Haynes, that, uh, and both, I think, uh, General Cruz, that they're trying to uh, use their economic power throughout the world, supply chains. That uh, seems to be a particular case with strategic minerals. Uh, do you see us in a, a, a fight, uh, quote unquote, over securing adequate strategic minerals? Because the, these are essential to uh, batteries and other things that could be the, the source of power in the next generation. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think. It, um, one way to think about this is as follows. They have, they have used 
rare earth elements and critical minerals as um, a leverage point for achieving geopolitical outcomes in different spaces because I think they both recognize their capacity with respect to mining and processing is significant and it gives them the ability to sort of move forward on a plan for how do we control the global supply chains in these areas and recognizing that these are incredibly important to the prosperity of many economic uh, you know, futures for different countries in the um, moving forward, they've seen the ability to use that, again, as a leverage point. And what we've seen in, in this area, and I think there's sort of history is um, a useful uh, lesson in this, which is to say that they have actually passed laws that, from dating back uh, decades now even, for being able to control the rare earth elements. And we saw them actually use this first, I think, in the context of um, a dispute with Japan over the Sakaku Islands, where they ultimately uh, used their leverage there by cutting off exports that were important to Japan's economy at the time as a way of pressuring them in the context of a land dispute and a maritime dispute. So, I mean, I think that's a an example of what we've seen. We've also seen them pass export controls of gallium and geranium more recently and other things that are um, important, and again, using this as a leverage point. And I think, uh, you know, what we have been trying to do is try to help policymakers understand how they're approaching this, where they are getting close to having control over a critical supply chain, and then uh, being able to highlight opportunities for trying to disrupt that so that we can maintain resilience in these areas. Thank you. Uh, no need for response unless I'm inaccurate, but one of the key advantages they do a tremendous amount of refining. So these minerals could be, in fact, I think Australia has a huge cache of these minerals, but the refining is all done in China. And that's the choke point. Yeah, lithium is a good example of this. Thank yeah. You. Senator Fish, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here today. Uh, Director Haynes, in the 24 annual threat, threat assessment, it stated that if Beijing believed that a major conflict with the United States were imminent, it would consider aggressive cyber operations against US critical infrastructure and military assets. Such a strike would be designed to deter U.S. military action by impeding U.S. decision-making, inducing societal panic, and interfering with the deployment of U.S. forces. In your opening comments, uh, you mentioned how uh, Chinese cyber actors um, are currently working to disrupt and destroy um, some of our critical infrastructure, putting um, putting things in place for for uh, future possibilities of of using that. In this setting, can you provide us with any examples of um, this type of malign cyber activity? So, yes, I think just to to be precise, but I think consistent with what you just said, what we see is both China and Russia effectively trying to pre-position themselves in ways that would allow them to conduct those kinds of attacks, um, not actually yet necessarily engaging in those attacks, and obviously we can discuss this further in a closed session. Um, and I can get back to you. I think we do have one or two examples that we've declassified of where they've tried to um, produce such footfold, footholds, essentially, in infrastructure. So okay. I'll, I'll do so in a follow-up. OK. Does the intelligence community work at all with um, our utility companies and others so that um, you can increase awareness about the possibility of attacks and how uh, the, these companies can work with you to help mitigate their vulnerabilities? Yes, we do so largely through, for example, CISA for, um, you know, cybersecurity related to critical infrastructure. Um, but we are very heavily working with them to ensure that they're able to provide the kind of warnings that you're describing for critical infrastructure across the board. And this is something that we spend quite a bit of time on. And as I indicated, we are seeing this sort of significant increase in attacks on control systems, which is so important to critical infrastructure. So much of our critical infrastructure relies on these types of automated control systems that are vulnerable to cyber attack. But again, what's um, you know sort of working through 
exactly uh, the attribution chain of where those attacks are coming from is quite challenging, and that's something that we spend quite a bit of time on. And, um, and again, as I indicated, so many of those attacks are, uh, are basically possible as a consequence of just not engaging in good cybersecurity practices, not updating passwords, not you know doing the kind of work that needs to be done, patching vulnerabilities that we're aware of. We will put out, um, you know, the government will put out uh, notices essentially about such vulnerabilities, and we really think it's crucial for folks to do those types of cybersecurity practices because if they did that, it actually would reduce the right. yeah significantly. Right. Over the past several years, we've watched as Russia and China, Iran, North Korea, they uh, are rapidly expanding and modernizing their nuclear arsenals. They're de also developing some really dangerous new capabilities um, that they can strike the United States with, and it, it, it really uh, can happen without much warning. Do we have any idea? Uh, general or director on how large uh, stockpiles that these countries have and or also uh, what their intention is in future production? I, I think in this setting, I would say, yes, we have a great, um, I think, insight into a handful of the countries uh, with, with um, good precision. Uh, there's a few countries where we have some ranges, and in the closed session, we'd be happy to uh, share those with you, as well as um, their likelihood of delivery of those to the continental United States. Right now, the United States provides a nuclear umbrella to our allies. Uh, they are dependent upon that, and I believe it... Um, it limits nuclear proliferation around this world because of the confidence that, that our allies have uh, in our umbrella that we provide them. Do you, do you worry about our allies losing confidence in our ability to provide them with a strong deterrence when we see our adversaries continue to um, build at a breathtaking pace their nuclear capabilities? I'll start. I mean, I think, um, I think you're absolutely right that the nuclear umbrella that we provide is intended to uh, ultimately um, counter proliferation of nuclear weapons. And, uh, and whether or not we're seeing a degradation in our allies' confidence that we will be there in these circumstances, given the thing is, it, I would say like, it, it's not that I take it for granted, but rather that I think it's something that we have to continue to be very vigilant in working with our allies to ensure that they um, continue to uh, have confidence in that nuclear umbrella in certain circumstances. I think there's been a fair amount of discussion about whether the Republic of Korea, for example, um, is, is you know, particularly concerned and uh, given what they're seeing from the North and whether or not they continue to have confidence in us being able to provide that nuclear umbrella versus their own particular, um, you know, whether or not they should in fact engage in their own uh, nuclear program. But our assessment at this stage is not that they are, uh, you know, pursuing that at this point, even though we recognize it's an area of public conversation. And I would just echo that uh, having been uh, assigned in the Indo-Pacific many times, so that's really some of the adversaries uh, who present the threat and then some of our allies who are engaged in the dialogue with this, uh, is that uh, they will occasionally, uh, when we see a change in stockpile, have a great conversation with us. And what you'll see is that as long as we continue that dialogue, um, they are confident in uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Um, and. I would offer, as we think through this, uh, sometimes it is not just the capacity, an, an increase in the numbers uh, don't change the nuclear umbrella that the U.S. provides. It's really only when you get to uh, changes in capabilities, uh, and every conversation that we've had to date uh, have been good, constructive uh, conversations, and those will just continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Shaheen, please. Um, good morning. Thank you both for being here. During the New Hampshire primary back in January, we had a domestic actor who used artificial intelligence to voice clone President Biden's um, voice and to target voters in a robo-scam in New Hampshire. 
Um, your threat assessment talks about how Russia is contemplating using um, electoral outcomes in 2024 to affect Western support for Ukraine. Um, both Russia and China are using AI to improve their capabilities to reach into Western audiences. You both mentioned that in your opening statements, the potential impact. Um, so and I have a couple of questions. First of all, are you able to share information with state and local officials when you see um, those kinds of AI or cyber-generated um, influence into what's happening in states? Director Haynes. Yes, thank you. So yes, working with CISA, what we've been doing is in fact been trying to expand our capacity to do so, but we do have direct communication with them on uh, basically deep fakes and other types of manipulated uh, media. And our advers are our adversaries using um, AI platforms in the United States to conduct disinformation and spread propaganda? Yes, absolutely. Russia in particular has um, you know, engaged in the use of artificial intelligence, generative AI in the context of their information operations. This is something that we've seen pretty consistently and they're not the only ones. And to what extent are we seeing those kinds of efforts um, attempting to manipulate the unrest that we're seeing on college campuses? So I don't have any information that suggests that they're doing that at this stage, but that doesn't mean that it won't really? develop. Really? Because Rutgers had a report that looked at the back end of TikTok, which has now been closed off, that says that, in fact, the Chinese are um, manipulating um, through disinformation to populations um, who use TikTok to manipulate the situation in Gaza and spread um, misinformation. You're not seeing any of that, even though that that's been publicly reported? Yes, that we're seeing with respect to the Gaza conflict. Apologies. I thought you talked about using that to instigate protests in the United States, and that's what we're not seeing. Does that make sense? You, you don't consider the protests on campus protests in the United States? I do. I'm sorry. We are seeing misinformation, disinformation that is being, um, and even true information that's being exacerbated with respect to the Gaza conflict. It's not directed at protesters so far as I am aware at this stage. Does that make sense? In other words, no, not looking I, to direct I, protests. I'm, I'm not being clear because okay. there have also been public reports that um, particular Chinese sympathizers are funding um, some of these protests to exploit the situation in Gaza. I mean, that's been reported publicly for several months, and in fact, even the, the committee in the House that's looking at China, ha Mike Gallagher has talked about this. Um, so are we not, are we seeing that? I am not seeing information that indicates that the Chinese government is directing that. So that's the piece okay, that I'm sorry, I, I don't see. Um, but we do see Chinese sympathizers who are doing this. That is part of FBI pieces as they're looking at what's happening within the United States, and I defer to them, and we can certainly get back to you on that question. Um, I can follow up in the closed session. Okay. But I'm also, I also wanted to raise the concerns about renewed reporting that has, again, as the result of uh, work done by CBS 60 Minutes that suggests that um, our adversaries um, could be behind the anomalous health incidents that have affected um, so many of our diplomats and service members abroad. Are you rethinking how the intel commun community is looking at what's happened with those anomalous health incidents and thinking that maybe we should do a little more investigating about who's behind those? Thank you, Senator. So, we absolutely are continuing to investigate what's happening with anomalous health institute, you know, incidents. And we identified in our last, uh, which is now a little over a year ago, intelligence community assessment, a whole series of gap areas that we have to continue to work to ensure that we're collecting intelligence, making sure that 
we are, in fact, uh, closing those gaps so that we can be more confident in our assessments, but also to determine whether or not they undermine any of the basic assumptions that we make in those assessments. And, um, and so that has been a continued process and will continue as a process. And there's no question that we all see this as a very important and you know, priority for the intelligence community. When we went back, obviously, after the 60 Minutes show, we said, you know, is there anything here that changes our assumptions, our assessments? Our analysts took a very close look at it. The vast majority, they say, they had already actually known before the intelligence community assessment was issued, but there were new things since the intelligence community assessment that had come in. And they still have not changed their basic assessments at this point, which is essentially that some elements think it's very unlikely, some think it's unlikely. They have various degrees of confidence as to whether or not a foreign actor would be is behind AHIs. But that is something that we just have to continue to work at in order to make sure that we, in fact, have that right. And moreover, that there isn't some further information that would be useful to us in understanding what is causing these. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I hope you will report back to the committee. Thank you, Senator Sheen. Senator Rounds, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to both of you for your service to our country and for your testimony here today. Uh, we live in what is perhaps the most complex, if not most dangerous, threat environment this nation has had to deal with since World War II. Accurate intelligence assessments are crucial to our success in navigating these challenges. Uh, Director Haynes, your annual threat assessment points out the persistent threat of malign influence uh, uh, operations that are being conducted by Russia, China, and, and Iran. A host of our systems and platforms critical to our national security operate on the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band of the spectrum, or the lower 3G band. I know we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit on this, but I, I just wanna get for public understanding the seriousness of this particular issue. Are you aware of any or of the Chinese efforts to encourage other nations to build out their 5G infrastructure on the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz portion of the spectrum? Let me come back to you on that question, sir. Okay. Um, let me ask it this way. Are you aware of any Chinese campaigns to encourage US companies to push the department, the Department of Defense, to auction off their share of the lower three B three three band, the lower three band of the uh, of the spectrum. I should come back to you just to be confident that I have it right, sir. Okay, I'll skip the rest of the questioning along that line till later. Okay. All right. Um, Director Haynes, based on the increasingly robust cooperation between. China, and Russia, is it fair to assume that if either one of them engaged in Thank hostilities you. with the United States and our allies, that it would increase the likelihood that the other would also initiate some form of hostilities as well? Yeah, we see China and Russia, even for the first time, exercising together in relation to Taiwan and recognizing that this is a place where China did definitely wants Russia to be working with them, and we see no reason why they wouldn't. General Cruz, in your professional military opinion, is the department taking into consideration this increased cooperation between Russia and China when it comes to identifying joint force requirements? Uh, I think the department is uh, concerned, um, has been for a while, and then what we've seen over the last two years has um, caused the department to relook at its analysis and become even more concerned about what are our joint force requirements in an environment where, as discussed, uh, we would anticipate uh, even if uh, Russia and China and a military force are not interoperable, they would certainly be cooperative uh, and we would need to take that into account in force structure and planning. I'll just address this to both of you then. Um, have any of our plans been updated to reflect this no limits partnership between Russia and China? 
I think what I'd say is from a departmental perspective, um, our planning process is a multi-year process, uh, starting <coughs> with what the threat looks like and then how do we step through uh, a fairly intensive vetting of what kind of operations we might want to conduct. Uh, and we have, um, for the plans that you're probably most interested in, we are in the middle of that revision today. Director Haynes. Yeah, and I would say, I, I mean, we've produced quite a bit of analytic material, I think a lot of which you have read, that indicates this increasing cooperation in the No Limits Partnership, as you say, but just across really every sector of uh, society, political, economic, military, technological, and so on. And so that is something that our understanding is prompting uh, new planning across the government in many respects. Bottom line is that, that basically if we were to have a conflict with one, the chances are we would have a second front and that the planning that we have to do includes confrontation on not just one front now, but the capabilities, the planning, the equipment, manpower, that would be necessary uh, for two different fronts simultaneously. Am, am I correct? Yeah, I think um, certainly it's a possibility. I, it, the question of just how likely it is, I think, differs depending on the scenario, which I'm sure is obvious to you, but yeah. A greater possibility now than what it was two or three years ago, though. I think from the Department of Defense uh, perspective, that would certainly be the case. Uh, and it just has to be taken into account whether or not we actually believe uh, there would be two full upfronts. Uh, that is analysis and assessments that will mature over time. Uh, but certainly we have to take that into account into the planning, as you have suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, uh, Senator King, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to uh, uh, thank you, Director Haynes, for starting with an emphasis on cyber. Uh, the truth is we're in an invisible war on many fronts on cyber already. Uh, as you outline, uh, everything from ransomware to attacks on SCADA systems to insertion of what I call sleeper cells in our uh, critical infrastructure. Um, you also emphasize rightly the, the fact that it's got to start at the desktop and, and personal cyber hygiene is, is critically important. However, particularly on these state-sponsored uh, potential attacks, well, I would say they've already occurred on our, on our critical infrastructure, we're not gonna be able to patch our way out of that. And you sort of slid by this in your opening comments, but we, they have to be, the, the, these state adversaries have to be deterred, do they not? They've gotta understand that we hold their systems at risk, and that's, part of, that's gotta be part of our strategy. It can't just be patching and cyber hygiene. Do you agree? I do. I think that the deterrence isn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily have to be about holding their systems at risk from a cyber perspective alone. It's part of an integrated strategy. That's that, right, but, yeah. but they have but, to feel yes. that they, they have something at risk and that there will be costs imposed if they move in this direction. Otherwise, it's a, it's a low cost kind of warfare that, uh, to which we are very vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, do you see, I, I think you also touched on this, do you see heightened Russian activity with regard to the upcoming elections? Yes, I mean, we are consistently, uh, you know, obviously the last several um, intelligence community assessments that we've done on election threats have identified Russia as really the major actor in this space and well, we continue to see them focused on this and increasingly so. Well, one of the things that worries me in, the, in 2016 and 18, we saw them penetrating something like 40 states electoral systems in terms of databases of voters and that kind of thing. They never did anything with it, but my contention has been they weren't doing that for fun. There's a great potential for disrupting our election simply by uh, erasing a, a voter database in, in Miami or having the lights go out in, in Atlanta. Uh, assess that risk, please. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that they're increasing their capacity and that they are developing and using new technologies that are available better at doing what they've done before and um, and ultimately pursuing uh, the potential for such altering. As you say, though, they haven't done it. And what, um, what I'd also say is that, you know, I agree with General Nakasone before he 
left indicated that he thought we were never better prepared to actually defend our election uh, security infrastructure. And I think, honestly, the intelligence community, and in particular NSA and others, have really done tremendous work in this area. And Cybercom is consistently engaged in both defensive and offensive work in this area to try to he, protect. He, General Nakasone coined the term defend forward, which we all know what that meant. Yeah. Uh, but CISA is also working with the states. Absolutely. And, and there's a, been a relationship of trust that I think is important. Yeah. W one other area, and, and you haven't touched on this, and that's part of my problem. I'm afraid in all the pivot toward great power competition, we're losing focus on terrorism. The terrorism threat hasn't gone away. And in terms of great power competition, deterrence is an important factor. But when you're talking about terrorism, deterrence isn't really a factor. They don't have a capital city that is at risk. They don't care about dying. So intelligence is our first line of defense. Reassure me that the intelligence community isn't look, losing focus on terrorism because we're just, you know, three or four guys with a, with a malintent can do an awful lot of damage in our country. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I, this is a critical issue. It's a growing issue in many respects. And it is one that we are absolutely focused on, and we can talk further in, obviously, closed session about some of the things we're doing well, in that I, area. I, I, just hope, I just hope that we don't lose that focus because, again, we, we tend to shift. You know, we had 9-11, and terrorism was everything for 15 or 20 years. Now it's all about China and Russia, and I just don't want to lose that focus. Final uh, uh, question. Uh, I recently finished a book about the KGB. The KGB is a essentially paranoid organization. They believe that the West is out to get them. And Putin came out of the KGB. How do we convince Putin that NATO is not an aggressive entity? We don't want to invade Russia. Nobody wants to invade Russia. We just want to protect the borders of Europe as they, as they have existed since World War II. It, it, do you agree with me that part, Putin really believes that that NATO is winding up to somehow uh, invade or otherwise invade, uh, otherwise violate the sovereignty of Russia. Yes, I, I do agree with you that there is a certain paranoia associated with this, and there is, um, you know, as I indicated in my opening remarks, Putin really does believe that the security of his country is at risk on some level. It is. Um, uh, I think a, a question actually I wish Director Burns were here for, you know, how could you convince him psychologically that in fact NATO is not? Because, uh, you know, in so many respects, the actions that NATO has taken has actually uh, been intended to reassure, and at the same time, it has um, not landed. And in many ways, what Putin has done has precipitated so many events that he was seeking to avoid. I mean, he obviously did not want to see NATO enlarge, and yet his invasion of Ukraine <laughs> precipitated, you know, Finland and Sweden joining, something that never would have happened, frankly, or we, we certainly would not have assessed that as being likely on the timeline that it occurred before the invasion. He's actually made it much harder to convince him of that because, you know, there were a number of efforts in NATO to actually talk to Russia. He's, he's provoked the very it. things he was worried about. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm sorry, my, my time yeah, is up. Please. Thank you very much, Apologies. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator King. Senator Harris, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for testifying in front of us today. Um, Director Haynes, of course, we're here to talk about global threats. We've heard about China, Russia, and so forth. Um, but earlier this week, the press reported an effort that would bring one of our global threats here to our homeland. Uh, a recent poll found that 71% of Gazans viewed Hamas's brutal attack on Israel including the rape of innocent women, their murder of children, and their murder of and capture of Americans as, quote, the correct decision. Uh, do you believe that welcoming a significant number of Gazans who likely are harboring these views into the United States, um, do you believe that that would threaten the safety of Americans? I mean, I obviously think uh, it is outrageous to think that um, that Hamas's attack on Israel was anything other than a terrorist attack that was utterly brutal and depraved. And uh, and I, you know, I don't have enough information to understand. You know, is when we analyze threats and where the threats come from and how they develop. That is something we do with great care and deliberation. And if you pointed us to here's the 
you know, individuals that we're concerned about, then we obviously would do an assessment okay. for you. So just broadly, though, 71% um, in this poll of those in Gaza support what Hamas did, and yet our president is considering an action to bring Gazan refugees to our homeland. Um, so I know you've spent your career working in the intelligence field, um, but given this poll, um, which I would assume is factual, uh, can you tell me uh, for certain that this proposed action by the President of the United States won't put our citizens at risk here in the United States? I'm unfamiliar with the poll, but I can tell you that the process for bringing individuals into the United States includes a very significant vetting process. That would be the kind of process I would expect would occur, and so therefore that would mitigate against any concern or risk that we would have. Okay. Um, I know that we have tried to do vetting on Afghans and, and other refugees as they come in. Um, many times that has not been successful. Um, I'm adamantly opposed to what the president is attempting to do. Um, so you're serving by law as the head of the intelligence community. And so you're saying basically under oath that you're really unaware of any risk that that, that might pose to our citizens? Sorry, I'm just, what I'm saying is that if there's a process for bringing people into the United States, I'm familiar with that process, mm -hmm. and that process is intended to mitigate against any risk of security, and that's something that I would feel confident about. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to pivot now um, to Hamas's backers, uh, the Iranian mullahs. Iran is currently enjoying a golden era of oil profits. We've seen over $80 billion dollars uh, in oil revenues, enabling Iran to give pay raises and recruitment bonuses to its proxies, and you've discussed some of those proxies earlier. Um, and these revenues come from sanctioned transactions, but the enforcement of the sanctions remains non-existent. Uh, do you agree, yes or no, that the decision not to enforce sanctions has directly led to the death of U.S. citizens? I, I couldn't make a sweeping statement like that, I'm afraid. I, the, um, I think it's no question that Iran uh, continues to benefit from oil sales and that they look for ways to get around sanctions, and that's something we've seen uh, them engage in, and that they are um, also, as you say, um, funding and assisting various groups in the region. I think it's also uh, the case that, frankly, the Iranian economy is in deep trouble right now and is actually suffering significantly. It's been one of the uh, challenges that they're facing. But beyond that, unless I'm faced with a particular scenario that we can assess for you, then we would obviously do that. Well, um, what I would say is that they do back Hamas. We, we know that. They back Hamas. And I wouldn't even say they're trying to get around sanctions because we just don't enforce them. Um, so there's, there's open trade of Iranian oil. Uh, we, as the United States, have these sanctions. We don't enforce them. So a, a good deal of their profits, of course, will go to support these proxies. And Hamas has killed Americans. They killed Americans on October 7th. Um, they have held eight Americans. Three we know are confirmed dead. Um, they're still holding five. So I would say that it, just in my, my mind, my estimation is that yes, they are using the profits to kill Americans. They have done it already. Um, I would like to see a, additional enforcement of these sanctions, not your area, but certainly um, it all ties together. So uh, I look forward to visiting more about this, um, maybe in a closed session, but uh, we have got to do better. And uh, I'm just using this time to make a, a statement too that I disagree wholeheartedly with what the president is trying to do by taking people out of Gaza and bringing them to the United States. I have seen failures in the vetting process before. I certainly don't wanna see those failures repeated. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Arts. Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director uh, Haynes, you have acknowledged Russian interference with our upcoming elections. 
In another area, I am wondering whether the intelligence community was able to identify Russia's use of social media to put out messages that the Maui wildfire was caused by government or uh, that, that uh, the Maui community should not trust FEMA. Was the intel community able to identify Russian uh, use of social media in this regard? And th this is an important question because I can, uh, of course, as we uh, experience so many more of these kinds of um, massive um, climate disasters or natural disasters, we can expect that Russia will use social media or some other ways to, to uh, create instability and questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, ma'am. And I, I, um, I don't remember, so we will get you an answer to that. Yeah. Uh, I know that, for example, the, the uh, uh, Microsoft, for example, was able to um, discern that Russia was doing this with regard to the Maui wildfire. So I really would like you to address this for me. Now that we know that there's a huge need for um, people to uh, to be able to work in the Intel arena in, in the Intel uh, environment, and so both of you, we know that there's a huge need for that. And for uh, uh, General Cruz, uh, the Pacific Intelligence and uh, Innovation Initiative is working to create a local skilled workforce to meet DOD's demand for cyber and intel professionals in Hawaii. There's a huge need in Hawaii for uh, people with this kind of, of background. How is this working? And uh, how um, are, are you also resorting to AI and, uh, and other means of, of uh, making your intel collection uh, more efficient and effective? Because you know, there's a huge need for people uh, with this kind of back, background, but we don't have those people yet. So can you respond to those two questions? Uh, certainly. Um, as mentioned, I've done several assignments to include uh, 2016 to 2019 as the Director of Intelligence uh, at uh, US Indo-PACOM and Camp Smith, uh, and uh, personally participated in several recruiting events with local universities and uh, in, in partnership with the National Security Agency, uh, and DIA, lots of recruiting, even down into the high school level, to build some local recruiting and local uh, workforce. And then in partnership with the intelligence community, working to develop uh, centers of academic excellence and a recruiting pool as well. So it is absolutely uh, critical. I do not believe we'll be able to fully man the intelligence requirements on island uh, without oh. doing local recruiting and being able to develop the workforce. And the local partners have just been absolutely tremendous. So to your, to your answer there, it's critical to do. We are investing in additional STEM and cyber pay where those kind of skill sets are required. But to your point, we have skill sets that we need uh, all across the board. On the uh, artificial intelligence Thank question you. about how do we become more efficient, I think what you'll find across the intelligence community is that we are applying AI, and in a closed session we can also talk about counter AI, but how can we be the most effective and the most efficient? I'd be happy to walk you through a couple of very specific examples that the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, is currently doing. And then right now we're looking at how do we partner with NGA, NRO, NSA, and DIA to bring almost a system of systems to be able to queue uh, and be much more effective and much more efficient in uh, how do we collect and how do we assess what we're collecting. Thank you. Director Haynes, uh, you acknowledge that uh, we have critical infrastructure in the private sector, i.e. our electrical grids that are subject to um, a cyber attacks. And you noted that you spent quite a lot of time in this area talking, I suppose, with the state people and uh, the private sector who provide these kinds of grids. But I'm, and, and you, you noted that good cybersecurity practices, such as something as relatively simple as updating the, the um, passwords, would be very helpful. Do you know if this is happening? And, and do, do you uh, partner with, uh, with, for example, the Public Utilities Commission in the state of Hawaii and other agencies that actually regulate uh, what they, they, these entities do, our electrical, uh, other power entities? But I just want to know, something as simple as updating passwords, do you know if this is happening? No. Yeah, so it, we are not working directly with um, uh, sort of the utility companies across the United States. It's really 
DHS in the form of CISA and the Department of Energy and others that are doing that. And we support their work by trying to make sure that they have the intelligence they need to provide warning, but also then to better understand what the questions are that are coming from uh, utilities in this space. And my understanding is that they are working very hard with them to improve their cybersecurity practices, patch vulnerabilities, deal with these issues. But it is just more an observation from our perspective that as we're looking at the attacks that are occurring, particularly against industrial control systems in the country, that um, the vast, vast majority of them would have been actually prevented if it weren't for those kinds of cybersecurity uh, practices not being what they need to be and, you know, instead using default pra um, passwords, weak passwords, not patching the vulnerabilities that are uh, publicly available and so on. So is the Department of Homeland Security and basically the Energy Department who would be the people that I should ask? And yeah, CISA within the Department of Homeland Security, um, and and we can give you uh, we can work with your staff to make sure you have yeah exactly who is talking to who that sort of thing and if that's helpful for Hawaii. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Hirono. Uh, I will uh, recognize Senator Scott, but I will depart shortly for the. Uh, Appropriations Committee and Senator Kane has agreed to chair the proceeding in my absence. I shall return. And someone once said that. Uh, so, uh, Senator Scott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Director Haynes and General Cruz, thanks, thanks for being here. We've discovered that the DOD purchases equipment from Communist China like printers, computers, TV cameras. Also, they purchase drugs made in Communist China, which shocks me. I, mean, I look at the secret that Communist China wants to just destroy our way of life. Um, I think we ought to stop everything. We, we should never buy anything. None of us should ever buy anything from Communist China. I don't think they ought to get a, a penny of our money uh, because all they do is build up uh, their military to eventually try to defeat us. A couple of weeks ago, the Secretary of Defense testified that he doesn't think we should purchase anything from China. Uh, do you each agree with the Secretary? I, I would echo the Secretary's comment. Certainly make it a practice to agree with the Secretary of Defense. So Israel was attacked uh, on October 7th. Um, I went back over to visit a kibbutz I was at, um, saw what the devastation. Uh, the Secretary of Defense also testified that there was no evidence that Israel was committing genocide in Gaza or committing war crimes in Gaza. Do each of you agree with that? I certainly have no evidence that that's the case, but the fact is in the intelligence community, we don't make that kind of determination. That's a legal determination made by others in the US government. And I would echo that answer. Okay, so you have no in intelligence that Israel is committing genocide or war crimes. So you don't have any evidence that they are. As I said, sir, we just don't make that determination. What we do is we identify the intelligence as we see it and we give it to others who would make that kind of determination. Okay. So we've watched what's happened on a lot of our college campuses like Columbia, uh, UCLA, UCLA, even here in D.C. at uh, George Washington University. Uh, do you have any intel of outside countries or groups funding some of these violent protests that are going on around the country? Thanks, sir. We don't. We have yet to see intelligence that Hamas, which is generally how the question is framed to us, is actually influencing the Gaza-related protests occurring in the United States or directing it in any way. That doesn't mean that over time we will not gather intelligence that indicates that certainly, for example, I would expect other countries to take advantage of the opportunity and use it as part of influence operations, but we'll continue to monitor that. General Cruz. Uh, the same thing. I, um, I don't believe we've seen exactly what you're asking, uh, but I would anticipate the environment would be uh, an opportunity that others would take advantage of. Okay. How about Qatar? Have you seen any evidence that they're um, supporting these protests? No, sir. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the head of Space Command asked him a question. If, um, if 12 of our satellites were destroyed and all the debris was up there, how much, how, how much of an impact would it have on um, the rest of our satellites that we depend on, and how would it impact our ability to um, uh, defend ourselves? Yeah. So have you done any intelligence briefings that, that you believe this is a risk, not a risk? So um, it, it, this is one of these things where it's so case dependent. In other words, um, just having debris in space is always a problem and one that obviously, uh, you know, ultimately 
um, allows for the potential damage of not just national security uh, interests, but also commercial and other interests that are um, effectively facilitated um, by space. But where the debris occurs uh, makes a difference. And so how much of an impact it would have would matter upon where it is, what other satellites are in the region, what satellites have been destroyed, for example. All of those things are important. And we can talk further in closed session, I think, about some of the modeling that we've done that might be helpful to you. John Cruz. I would just add the other part of the uh, calculus there is which 12 satellites in this scenario would be uh, taken out and that there's a capability reduction that is also a decrement that we'd be very much concerned about. But uh, purely to the debris question, I, I agree there's been some modeling done uh, that we could discuss. How big a risk do you think it is on uh, ingredients in our drugs from China for our military? Either of you? I don't know that I know enough about that topic to be able to speak uh, on that, and I'd be more than happy to um, uh, work with our analysts to see if we have an answer okay. for you that would be useful for you. Does it surprise you guys that, that so, many, so many of the ingredients in our drugs are coming from China when they're at the same time trying to, uh, to kill Americans through you know, fentanyl and, and everything else, and that we're st our military is still relying on a majority of our, I, th I think it's a majority of our drugs Ingredients are coming from China. I, I don't believe that I'm surprised by how the market has developed over years and decades, and then where we find ourselves today. Uh, as the environment uh, wants us to withdraw, uh, there is a uh, supply chain that we will have to modify, you know, to implement the policies you're talking about. But certainly, you've accurately described uh, how the market has developed and how our supply chains currently work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Scott. Good to see you both. Um, I, I want to just acknowledge some amazing work that the U.S. military has done in two very challenging contexts recently. The U.S. effort to support um, Israel together with other nations during the attack from Iran was truly uh, a superb operation, and I don't think that kind of thing happens by accident or by chance. It, it demonstrates an awful lot of training, an awful lot of capacity, an awful lot of cooperation. And had we not been successful in that, the level of escalation that we might have seen in the region, the damage to Israeli cities, communities, people, the likely escalation thereafter could really have been devastating at a very critical time where the last thing we need is escalation in the Middle East. And so I just, at, at a hearing like this, I want to acknowledge the great service of uh, U.S. military in, in forming together with Israel and other nations, a defense against the Iranian attack. And second, the work that the U.S., primarily the Navy, but not solely the Navy, has done in the Red Sea to repel attacks by Houthis against commercial ships, military ships, again, in tandem with allies, but most of the work is being the hard work, the kinetic hostile fire is being uh, taken by U.S. military has been truly remarkable. And the remarkable thing, and I know this has got to keep you guys up every night, is when we are sitting there in the Red Sea and absorbing incoming over and over and over again, we have to have 100% success rate. It can't be 98, can't be 99%. My understanding is we've, it's been 100% up to now. I don't want to jinx it. And it's been, we've, ha we've ha been as close as 3,000 yards from striking a U.S. ship that we were able to take down with a Gatling gun, some use of missiles has enabled us to take down incoming missiles or drones at further distance, but 3,000 yards is pretty close. And we've got a lot of Virginians on those ships in the Red Sea, and I know other members here have sailors from their states there too. So I want to start with that. Um, and, and that, it takes a lot of work to get to that. I mean, the development of the Aegis system, I and mean, goes back decades, and, and, and good intel and using the intel well both to defend but also to strike positions in Yemen that could do damage. I mean, I just want to express appreciation. I do want to focus on the Red Sea, and so let me begin with Director Haynes. What does the IC assess about the Houthis' continuing threat on commercial shipping, and how long is that threat likely to remain active? Yeah, so... Our assessment is essentially that it is going to remain active for some time. It is um, in part because Abdu'l-Malik, the leader of the Houthis, 
uh, continues, we think, to see domestic political advantage for some of the actions that he's taking, that um, that he is interested in kind of burnishing his regional reputation, and he has seen this to be adding to that in many respects, and that um, they continue to indigenously produce a fair amount of UAVs, other uh, weapon systems, and so on, and of course are also getting assistance from the Iranians in this respect, and that neither of those things are likely to change in the near future. Now, that doesn't mean that the strikes that uh, the Department of Defense and the coalition um, with our allies have taken haven't had impact. They have, but it's been insufficient to really stop the Houthis from going down this road. And so well, that is sort of our... What, what's your assessment about if there were to be a ceasefire in Gaza, what's the likelihood that the pace of attacks would, would significantly reduce? Yeah, it's, it, it is honestly unknown at this stage. They have indicated that um, at different times that they would comply with the ceasefire. So I think there's a fair possibility that that is what And wasn't there do. some abatement of the pace of attacks into the Red Sea during the prior, first the ceasefire? That's exactly yeah. right. They did in the prior one. But it's it's just it, one of the things that's been challenging is that their rationale for their attacks has shifted over right. time a bit. And it's gotten more complicated at times. He's indicated that uh, they wouldn't stop unless and until humanitarian assistance had been delivered to a certain degree, things like that. And so it seems like there are additional requirements um, that he's added, but it doesn't mean that he wouldn't pause during the ceasefire. And, and even if the ceasefire, you know, might under past rationale lead them to stop to the extent that, that they feel like this is, bur you know, burnishing their reputation for being kind of a bad actor, they might continue even in a ceasefire condition. Yeah, it's possible. La last question. Why aren't more allies and members of the coalition helping the United States and actually taking military action against Houthis who are targeting their ships? I mean, we're protecting commercial ships of other nations. The number of nations that are participating in the military activity seems small to me. What, what, why, how, do I how should I understand that? Yeah, I mean, I'll start, and General Cruz may have more to add here. I think a number of them really are um, trying to help in any way that they can, and we've seen it come in different forms, uh, you know, and I, I would really defer to the Department of Defense in terms of the degree of it, but let me... Yeah, How about a quick it. answer since I'm over my time, General Cruz? Uh, sir, I think I would just add that uh, uh, to the DNI's point. Um, many of them are contributing in other ways, uh, and there are important ways. And um, while there's few that might be doing uh, defense in the Red Sea, uh, specifically they're doing things that we actually count on, and we appreciate the partnership, uh, but would welcome anyone else who would want to participate. Great. Senator Cotton. Uh, Senator Ernst raised the uh, media reports that suggest President Biden may admit Gazans to this country as refugees. Um, I agree with her. I think that would be insane. There's a reason why Egypt won't let them in, and Egypt is right on their border and speaks their language and has a vested interest in protecting itself from threats from Gaza. Uh, if they won't let them in, I don't think the United States should let them in either. But, but I want to focus now on the actual threats from the crisis at our southern border of actual migrants who have crossed in this country already. Director Haynes, FBI director, recently said... The terrorist threat level that we're contending with right now is at a whole other level. Do you agree with Director Ray's assessment? Yes, I think it's just um, absolutely the terrorist threat level is of grave concern, and we can obviously have discussions in closed sessions about what that means, but, um, but so I would agree with that. How many illegal immigrants on the terror watch list have been caught at the southern border this year? I believe, I don't remember the number exactly, and we can get you that. Um, uh, many of them, as I recall it, are um, uh, ones that came out of Colombia. We should give you I think the answer is 75. Do you, do you think we pitched a perfect game at the border and caught every single migrant on the terror watch list trying to cross into our country? No, but being on the terrorist watch list, meaning that if there is uh, known or suspected terrorists or there's information that they may have had contact with, doesn't actually mean that they are all. Okay, how many terrorists have tried to cross the southern border during the Biden administration's tenure? Sir, I don't know that I can give you a precise I think the answer number is on that. 357. Again, do you think we pitched a perfect game for the last three and a half years and got 357 out of 357? 
No, I don't think so. How many terrorists tried to cross the southern border during the four years of the Trump administration? I don't know, sir. I think the answer is 11. The Biden administration has also granted entry to more than 7,300 illegal aliens who are known as special interest aliens, which means they come from notorious terrorist breeding grounds like Uzbekistan, Syria, and Iran and, and pose a potential national security risk. That number was based on data collected before Hamas's October 7th atrocity against Israel. Uh, since then, do you think that there may be an even greater surge of Islamic extremists trying to cross our open southern border? Can you repeat the question, sir? Um, the Biden administration had granted entry to more than 7,300 illegal aliens in the special interest alien category from places like Uzbekistan, Syria, and Iran, and that comes before, that number came before the October 7th atrocity in Israel. Since then, do you think there might have been an even greater surge in Islamic extremists trying to cross our open southern border? We haven't seen um, Hamas directing essentially folks or others in the region to come into the United States to engage in attacks from the Gaza conflict. That doesn't mean that uh, obviously this isn't something that could develop over time, but we're not seeing that related to the Gaza conflict, if that's Last sort of year, of Customs and Border Patrol officials in San Diego issued an internal intelligence notice titled, Foreign Fighters of the, Israel, of the Israel-Hamas Conflict May Potentially Be Encountered at the Southwest Border. So CBP certainly expects Islamic radicals will try to exploit the border. Do you think We're that, that report is excitable and exaggerated? No, I think it's absolutely you know, appropriate to be vigilant on these issues. And as we've talked about in the context of the Gaza conflict, we've seen that galvanize, in a sense, different terrorists around uh, the world in different ways. And so I think we're just trying to be as careful as we can. We just haven't seen. Okay. Um, I would turn to China that. briefly here. Um, last week, Secretary Blinken, on his Ballyhood trip to China, said that China is, quote, overwhelmingly the number one supplier for Russia's war against Ukraine. Do you agree with Secretary Blinken's assessment? There is no question that the dual-use material that's coming from China is having an enormous is it, or impact. Is China overwhelmingly the number one supplier? I mean, they are overwhelmingly the number one supplier to the defense industry in Russia okay. right now. He also said that the, those supplies are having, quote, a material effect, end quote, on the war in Ukraine. Do you agree with Secretary Blinken's assessment there? I do. I indicated in my opening remarks that we see their supply is actually one of the key factors that essentially adjusted the momentum on the battlefield in Ukraine. Okay. On March 18th, 2022, three weeks after the war started, President Biden had a, a call with Xi Jinping where he said, quote, do not provide, quote, material support, end quote, to Russia. Otherwise, you and China could find yourself in, quote, significant jeopardy, end quote. Uh, that appeared to have uh, gotten his attention. Xi Jinping's attention in 2022, if you look at trade data, but over the last year, China has become, or China has now become what you and Secretary Blinken call Russia's overwhelmingly number one supplier. Uh, one of your predecessors as Deputy National Security Advisor says that um, Joe Biden is now not enforcing the red line he drew in March 18th. Do, do you agree that President Biden is now refusing to enforce that red line he drew with Xi Jinping in March 2022 about providing material support to China? I don't. I, here's the challenge that I think we've encountered, which is basically there was a lot of focus on China not providing lethal support. And, uh, and what they have done is try to avoid what is characterized as lethal support, in other words, you know, a fully constructed gun or weapon system, et cetera, to Ukraine. And that has been something that they've maintained. But what has happened in the meantime is they provided effectively dual use materials such as nitrocellulose, a whole series of critically important long sort of holes in the tent for the Russia reconstitution of their defense industry. And that's been the space that policymakers I know have been working, including with Congress, to try to prevent from coming from going to Russia. And there's been mixed success in pushing well, back my, against my, that. My time is up. I would dispute the characterization that China is only providing dual use material. But I don't think there would be any question that President Biden drew a red line in March of 2022 and he has not been enforcing it against China since. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Jules Byrne, please. Director Haynes, uh, earlier this week, the administration published an updated 
National Security Memorandum on Critical Infrastructure, Security, and Resilience. How is the IC ensuring effective intelligence sharing and information exchange regarding threats to critical infrastructure, including threats to food and agriculture sector? Thank you, Senator. I know this has been an area that you have focused on for quite some time. And we're basically through our uh, critical, our, our cybersecurity threat integration intelligence center, we have been expanding our support in effect, um, anticipating the NSM, but also more generally uh, for critical infrastructure, working with CISA, working with the cyber director, obviously, out of the executive branch and, and across the interagency. And I think it um, continues to be an effort um, in moving across different sectors that are at risk in this area. Given the recent news about uh, avian bird flu have leapt to other animals, um, can you talk a little bit about um, since COVID-19, um, I've been advocating for a One Health approach to biosecurity that incorporates animal, plant, and environmental health in addition to human health to detect and prevent the next pandemic. Do you believe that the IC is sufficiently equipped to detect and assess the full range of biological threats that can appear in humans, animals, and plants? And how is the National Counter Proliferation and Biosecurity Center at ODNI supporting this effort? Yeah, I think it would be um, always uh, an overstatement to say that we can detect everything that would be, uh, you know, um, ultimately uh, a potential vector for both human and, um, and animal. Uh, concerns, but the fact is we have really expanded and invested a tremendous amount in improving our biosecurity practices and not just in terms of just, um, you know, what the um, National Counterproliferation and Biosecurity Center does in the context of allocating resources for collection to ensure that we actually have what we need in order to be able to identify vectors, but also in doing some really extraordinary modeling for how it is that we can detect when there are outbreaks, what's happening, and how we can manage it, thinking through the analytic structure that we need to build it into a variety of different functional and regional areas that we're managing in these er these spaces. and supporting, which has been um, obviously a, a main effort by the policy community, a broader all of government kind of biosecurity mm -hmm. uh, effort in these areas. And, so I do think we were improved, but I think there's still room to grow. Because what the legislation would do, it would co-locate um, not only uh, the IC community, but with the agriculture and scientific community so that you're in constant communication on a regular basis in the same way we do fusion centers for anti-terrorism, fusion centers for cybersecurity, it would be a One Health fusion approach. And I know that's not the exact um, organization today, yeah. but today are you at least having communications with those sectors um, to be informed and to get the most up-to-date information possible? Yeah, our director has actually invested quite a lot in improving our communication with non-Title 50 agencies, which is yep. how we think about it, you know, with including the Department of Agriculture and others so that we can actually have those sorts of conversations. And um, and it's also been supported by the work that our uh, Cybersecurity Threat and Integration Center has done, which is also improving our communication with um, various uh, non-Title 50 um, agencies and departments, including, again, the Department of Agriculture, because we see them as one of the major sort of threat uh, potential vectors. Thank you. Um, I think, as you know, the National Defense Authorization Act from 2024 expanded the Cyber Service Academy to allow up to 10% of graduates to serve in the non-DOD intelligence community if that component enters into an agreement with the Department of Defense. Has ODNI entered into discussions with the DOD yet to take advantage of this source of cyber professionals? And have you encouraged non-DOD components of the IC to pursue um, this talent pool? Yes, absolutely. And I believe we are in discussions, but we have not yet concluded an agreement. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Mullen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Hines, you had mentioned briefly a little bit about uh, Iran's economy. You want to broaden a little bit more on that? I, I should get you the facts and figures. I don't have them in front of me, and we'll supply But you said it was, you. In, it was in bad shape, right? Yes. I... Um, I, I, uh, I, I I don't disagree that it's probably not in great shape, but would you agree it's in better shape than it was three years ago? No, I think we, we just recently did a piece that really looked at well, some of the challenges. Ma'am, according to yeah. the, the 
the statistics that study that. Uh, actually, the GDP for um, for uh, Iran is projected to have a ninth consecutive year by 2029. And in the last uh, four years since Biden released the sanctions, they've actually doubled their GDP. Uh, in 2019, they were just about 250 billion in the GDP. In 2020, they had dropped to below 200. And today, they're over uh, they're over 500 and projected to have continue to grow until 2029 underneath the current statistics. Now, this is stuff that's open source that you can get. And I can actually read it to you. The gross domestic product for GDP is currently priced in Iran was forecasted to continue to increase between 24 and 29, which has already had four consecutive years of increase uh, over $101 billion, U.S. dollars, at a 24.15% increase over the next four years. Since uh, 2025 uh, to 2022, their gross domestic output is 576.24 billion. So has the sanctions uh, that were lifted been a good thing or a bad thing for Iran and the war, and the war on terror? So I will get you the figures that we have on this issue and see if uh, that well, helps. Well, I mean, these figures, are, these figures are government figures. I, I, just, I literally just pulled them up since we were sitting here, since you said that. And so I think, I mean, you're the director of intelligence. These are something that you really should know because it, the more money they have is not good for the U.S. Would you agree with that? I certainly think that the more money that they spend on destabilizing activities, on funding various groups, and is there any? Is there any? All of those things are not. Is there good. really any debate that Iran is the number one sponsor of war on terror at this point? They are absolutely a sponsor. Okay, so we can both agree that the more money they have is bad for that. Absolutely. Okay, but what I would say so is, is that, for it, example, if you so look is this a good thing? Well, ma'am, what I'm trying to get to is yeah. the the. We saw a decrease in their GDP when Trump put in strong sanctions and worked with Congress. Those were lifted underneath the Biden administration. Do you agree with those actions? I don't take policy positions from the intelligence well, community. Perspective. The intelligence is following the, the money. I understand. So is it, from the intelligence to... perspective, not a policy then, yeah. from an intelligence perspective, Director Haynes, was that a good thing? It's neither a good thing or a bad thing. If you want an assessment on whether or not how can you say it's not? It's neither a same. good thing or a bad thing, ma'am. When you just said that they're the number one sponsor of war on terror, that's not debatable. We know that. And and a while ago you said that their economy was faltering, but yet we've seen that it's actually doubled underneath the Biden administration since they since they lifted the sanctions that Congress and uh, the Trump administration put in place. That means they have more money to spend on this. That and you can't say that's that's not really a policy question. That's from an intelligence perspective. That's got to cause problems, Senator. It, so on the economy, why don't we get you our assessment of how they're doing? Even if I'm right that they're having challenges economically, I don't think that necessarily is a line that you can draw directly between sanctions and how their economy is doing. There are a number of factors that obviously you have to look at in order to determine that. And I'm more than happy to do an assessment for you that helps yeah. to identify what the impact of either of different yeah. sanctions, less sanctions, more sanctions, all of those things on the economy, and then how that relates to spending, for example, on national security issues that are of importance to us, which we do produce an annual report for you on. Well, I, I, uh, I would appreciate that. And I, I don't think that, you know, we'd, say that their economy is in great shape. I mean, that's, but we can say that throughout all the, you know, I've said, say all the Middle East, the, the middle of the Middle East, uh, we could say that there's a problem there with their economy. Uh, but what I'm getting to is that the current position that the administration, this current administration has taken underneath Biden has not been helpful for our security posture we have seen that their economy has greatly increased and is going to continue to increase if we stay underneath the, big, the, the continued projection of the way we're treating Iran currently. Uh, I, I think that our posture should, and you can agree, disagree, or not. In fact, you don't even have to answer it because I'm not going to put you in that position again. Our, our, we have to re-look at our, at our posture we have with them because they, their GDP has increased, and that means they're spending on the war on terror against us and against our allies has also increased. 
with that, I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Uh, Senator Warren, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Director Haynes, when you testified before the committee last year, we talked about how crypto is being used to help finance major threats against national security, like North Korea's nuclear weapons program, Iran's ability to evade sanctions, and ransomware attacks on American hospitals. It seems the problem is getting worse. According to the Wall Street Journal last month, crypto has become, quote, indispensable to Vladimir Putin's war machine, allowing Russia to get around sanctions and to throw billions of dollars into its war against Ukraine. According to the Treasury Department, Hamas's terrorist attacks against Israel in October were financed in part with crypto and their current financing depends on crypto. According to the blockchain analytics firm, Elliptic, um, Iran is deep into crypto. And so let's focus for just a minute on how Iran is using crypto. Director Haynes, reports from our intelligence national security agency say that Iran uses crypto to evade US sanctions. For example, in four years, Binance, just one of many crypto exchanges, processed $8 billion in transactions for Iran. Can you explain what threat that poses for our national security? Yeah, I think it, there's no question that cryptocurrency is a significant issue for our national security. And as you say, we talked about DPRK last time, and I, you know, today we continue to produce statistics that indicate that it, I think it's now over 50% of their foreign currency revenues are coming through crypto, yep. that there is really just significant exploitation of this as a way to get around sanctions to ultimately engage in illegal transactions to um, uh, to support a system, and certainly the ransomware attacks and other things like that demonstrated. And with respect to Iran, we see this. I, it's... It, um, so there's no question that Iran permits the use of cryptocurrencies, right, and smart contracts to pay for imported goods because it lacks access to the US dollar, and that's a consequence of the sanctions regimes that are in place. It, what is also true, though, and I think is just to, to frame it, doesn't mean that this isn't a problem, but its use is relatively limited as compared to other transaction pieces. So um, it's not been as much of a major factor in our judgment as um, I, it might otherwise seem. So in other words, we've got in early August 2022, the country made its first official cryptocurrency payment for imports with were worth 10 million out of a total of 102 billion for imports. So it's just, it's a, and it's sort of a similar challenge in the context of uh, Russia as well, where we see them using cryptocurrency, and I think it is almost certainly going to expand in different ways. But there are some kind of structural limitations on their capacity. So, so let's look into that. that. Let's yeah. look at the structural limitations here, because I, I think what you're telling me is Iran is definitely using crypto to move money around. Yes. And to do that to evade sanctions and to fund Hamas. And... Your assessment is consistent with the assessment of the Treasury Department on this. But it's, that's not all that Iran is doing with crypto. Iran is also making money by processing crypto transactions for other people. So as you know, crypto relies on middlemen. Uh, in the crypto world, they're called miners or validators. And they process or verify transactions. The Iranian government officially entered the crypto industry in 2019 because it could make money doing it. So if I sent $1,000 in Bitcoin over to you, Lieutenant General Cruz, and you and I might be sitting here in Washington when we engage in this transaction, but Iran may be the one that is processing the transaction for us and pocketing the transaction fee that I pay. And neither one of us would never would ever even know that we were enriching Iran through this transaction. According to one estimate in 2021, Iran processed as much as 7% of the world's Bitcoin transactions, enough to earn them about a billion dollars. So Lieutenant General Cruz, the bigger the crypto market gets, the more opportunities Iran has to profit 
by processing other people's crypto transactions. Let me ask you, how important is it that we cut off this revenue source for Iran? Well, if I could, uh, what I would say is this is uh, not dissimilar to the old previous conversation about the source of revenue, whatever Iran's source of revenue, crypto or uh, other transactions, oil sales, and then how Iran uses it. So it does come the more uh, finances they have available to them, this or other sources, certainly uh, allows uh, Iran to make decisions on how it's going to spend. All right. So look, we have the tools to cut off countries like Iran from the banking transactions, but those tools weren't designed for cryptocurrencies, so crypto money keeps flowing here. And that's why I'm concerned about any effort to regularize stable coins without giving regulators the full set of tools they need to crack down on terrorist financing. Anything Congress does to legitimize and grow the crypto market must have strong protections so we don't increase money-making opportunities for Iran and other adversaries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, Senator Rosen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank Director Haynes and General Cruz for testifying today and, uh, and for your service. And so I guess the theme this morning is uh, Iran, and of course I'm going to uh, expand on a little bit, but Iran and the Russia defense cooperation, because Iran has used the war in Ukraine to bolster its own military partnership with Russia by providing Putin's regime hundreds of drones that have killed Ukrainian civilians. In return, Russia's providing Iran with missiles, cyber tools, air defense systems, and Iran's also seeking to acquire modern Russian fighter jets, helicopters, and radars. So, General Cruz, how does Iran's capacity to produce and export long-range attack drones evident in both the Middle East and against Ukraine potentially accelerate the spread of such capabilities globally, particularly with Iran supplying these systems to Russia for its use in war? And um, I'll just add, if you want to talk about both of these, how does this acquisition also enable Iran to take an even more aggressive posture uh, right now in the Middle East? I think Iran has um, spent considerable time and in, in effort uh, to be able to produce uh, the kinds of uh, UAVs and other equipment that others would find value, uh, and they continue to improve the capabilities of what they've been selling over time. Uh, you mentioned several hundred. I would say it's probably uh, even a thousand or more mm -hmm. uh, of UAVs that Iran has provided directly to the Russians that they are using on the battle space. Uh, and also providing design so Russian can do their own manufacturing uh, of that. So uh, this has been a, a somewhat new business line. Uh, it's just a continuation of uh, Iran's previous business line, but it does provide uh, two things. One is a revenue source to Iran. Uh, it provides also some capabilities to the uh, proxy organizations and other adversaries and increases their capability uh, and their capacities over time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit into uh, what powers a lot of these uh, systems, particularly uh, as we think about well, Bitcoin, cyber, all these threats, um, artificial intelligence. Um, and so we have a little bit uh, to worry about in artificial intelligence competition. So Director Haynes, as we continue to explore really the potential of artificial intelligence, and we have to really discuss these ethical boundaries, right? Because there's growing concern that our strategic competitors like China, uh, Russia, and others may not adhere to the same ethical standards, especially regarding the weaponization of technology, uh, potentially leading to uh, abuse, which can threaten our global security, our national security. So could you discuss the implications of this difference in ethical standards uh, for AI development and deployment, particularly in terms of threats uh, to our security, and how do we work with our allies to put in these ethical standards? Because we know artificial intelligence, it's only, it's garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in is what comes out, and that's why this is particularly important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I agree with how you've characterized the challenge, and I think it's, it is one of the, um, you know, there's sort of the first order issue, which uh, is an ethical issue, but maybe even a step beyond what you're describing, which is to say that... An educational also, issue, because yeah. computers learn. Exactly, <laughs> right. yeah. And, and it's also, I, I mean, so one is it clearly, um, in many respects, 
generative AI in particular, but AI generally can exacerbate existing threat streams as we've seen them and make our adversaries far more effective and also sort of lower the cost of entry into these kinds of uh, you know threat streams. So in other words, for information operations, for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. for biosecurity, other mm -hmm. issues like that, obviously these are um, uh, technologies that allow you to be more effective and to do so or do so more cheaply in many respects um, in a number of scenarios. So there's that piece of it. A second piece of it, I would say, is that um, there are, as you say, different standards that we apply. So, for example, our commercial uh, companies will um, only train their models on what is appropriate from an intellectual property perspective, whereas mm -hmm. you may see other countries not paying attention to those kinds of standards and getting into other uh, material, and that can you know, um, create a different series of challenges mm -hmm. Um, in these spaces and how you sort of develop against that, you obviously need to ensure that you're paying attention to that through regulatory, through standards, through other things that can be useful to try to achieve that. In addition, um, to your point, we obviously care very much about the governance of AI, how we're applying sort of privacy and civil liberty issues to the work that we're doing. And, you know, I think um, on the one hand, um, that may mean that we move sometimes a slightly more slowly or we're thinking through how it is that we're ensuring what we're producing uh, is consistent with our values and our ethics in these spaces. But at the same time, I actually think that can increase the efficacy in many respects of the work that we're doing because mm -hmm. ultimately what you really want to do is train AI on the best possible data, quality data, things that do not have inherent biases in them, things along those lines that will actually get you to answers that are more effective in answering the questions that you're ultimately trying to do. So we are spending quite a bit of time both on thinking about how we use it in a positive way and for our own mission, but also how to counter what it is that we're seeing, obviously, from allies in these spaces. Maybe that. Thank you. I have some questions on anti-Semitism. I'll submit them for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Rosen. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Haynes, I have a couple of questions. Um, so recently you stood up the Foreign Malign Influence Center, um, and you were quoted um, as stating that it would allow the FMIC to track disinformation campaigns from a foreign country, but also quote, the public opinion within the United States. What does that mean? I, I don't know. That well, actually, okay. Is, well, sorry. What, yeah. Are you tracking the public opinion of the United States? No. Okay. Um, how, is, um, how is FMIC different than CISA? I thought CISA was created to do this. Ah, uh, okay. So... FMIC is actually, um, we established it pursuant to a statute right. that asked us to establish it. It, it. What we do within the Farm Align Influence Center, which encompasses our election threat work effectively across the community, is um, allocate resources in relation to collection. We work through analytic work that is supportive of what CISA does, for example, um, but also uh, in uh, coordination with our cybersecurity intelligence um, threat integration center. And, um, and we um, ultimately coordinate the work that the community is doing in order to counter foreign malign influence. That is not something um, that CISA does. In other words, CISA is taking our products and the intelligence that we produce and is ultimately deciding what it is it needs to be, for example, shared uh, with local and state partners, with uh, industry, depending on a cybersecurity threat or other things like that, in order to protect our critical infrastructure. Okay. So uh, in a sense, we do the normal intelligence community work that we do, and they basically take that information. Hopefully, we are supporting them in their mission to actually take action in response. Okay. In, in your um, 2024 unclassified annual threat assessment, uh, make several mentions uh, of the threats of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, specifically, the report mentions um, adversarial state actors leveraging disinformation to attempt to propagate divisive societal issues to weaken America and our democracy. It also references um, medical disinformation as a threat to global health security. Does... Um, uh, how do you, what are you, what, what steps are, are you, about? what are you doing here? I, I'm, because as you know, a court has found that there's been great coordination 
between the intelligence community and government agencies to censor speech in the Missouri versus Biden, the Fifth Circuit, to censor speech. And so the determination was made that opinions about efficacy of masks or transmissibility of COVID after the vaccine was taken down at the behest of government actors. So my big concern is, are you using this to um, quell op uh, dissenting points of view? Because I don't know what you know, medical disinformation means and why, you know, if you're involved with censoring or, or limiting speech of Americans who may have different points of view, let's say if masks work or not. So is that what you're talking about with medical misinformation? So just a few things. I think I, I um, obviously don't play a lawyer in this position, but I I'm, would not accept your characterization of what the court has found. And well, I would actually was the lawyer that filed, I was the attorney general that filed the lawsuit. So understood. I'm pretty familiar with that case. Okay, understood. I am just saying <laughs> that from my perspective, the intelligence community does not and has not engaged in any sort of censorship of... Well, okay, well, okay. I have limited time, so let me just... Focus okay, on the sure. question you're asking, which is just basically in the context of um, medical disinformation. So, for example, we saw um, Chinese uh, efforts to... Um, uh, ultimately engage in disinformation campaigns about um, the U.S. vaccine, for example, the quality of those types of vaccines, whether that ultimately if you take a different vaccine, you might be better, the Russian um, efforts to do that as well. So that's the kind of thing. Is medical misinformation, if I were to go online right now and say that masks are ineffective and they might actually hurt kids, is that medical misinformation? Well, you're not a foreign actor, so that wouldn't be foreign malign influence. What we would be looking for is a campaign from another country, such as Russia and China, engaging in disinformation okay. about, um, for example, what I just described in the context. So I, I just, one last question then. So obviously you work with the FBI, right? Absolutely. The FBI is actually part of the intelligence. Correct. Um, have there been any consequences to the FBI's pre-bunking of the Hunter Biden laptop story, because we know that Elvis Chan was claiming that the Hunter Biden laptop, even though it was in the FBI's possession, was a quote-unquote Russian hack and leak operation. And it wasn't, right? We know that it wasn't, but yet there's sworn affidavits now from senior executives of social media companies that said that it's exactly what was they were told. Have there been any repercussions? Has anybody been fired for you know, claiming this was a Russian hack and leak and operation when in fact it was Hunter Biden's laptop? And by this way, the story got censored. Has there been any repercussions? Have you done anything about that? I suspect that we're not gonna have the same characterization of the scenario either, but we're happy to take this offline and see if there is anything that we need to answer. I, I hope so, because I have genuine concerns about the credibility of the intelligence community after what's come to light in that litigation. And I don't think that's, you know, anyway, I'm happy to talk to you about it more. I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Senator Smith, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here, and thank you for your service to our nation. There have been reports um, as recently as this morning about a potential progress in discussions with Saudi Arabia about uh, a pact that, in effect, could lead to normalizing relations to, with Israel. Those discussions, I'm aware, were underway before the October 7th attack with great promise. Uh, could you update us as to what you know about those discussions and whether an agreement with Saudi Arabia directly without involving Israel in the first stage is possible at this point? Thank you, Senator. I, I couldn't, the intelligence community is not involved in those discussions, and uh, but I'm happy to defer that, obviously, and we can get you an answer from the policy community. Thank you. Um, on Iran, um, I am somewhat um, perplexed about what you say in your report. Iran is currently not undertaking the key nuclear weapons development activities necessary to produce a testable nuclear device. But then you say um, Iran continues to increase the size and enrichment level of its uranium stockpile and so forth. Isn't Iran continuing to take steps that would put it in a position to have nuclear arms? 
Yeah, I think we can probably talk about this more in closed session, but I think the distinction that's being made in the report in that particular scenario is basically to say that what they're doing is um, shortening the time period that it would take for them to actually, for example, um, uh, enrich a sufficient amount of material for a nuclear weapon if they make a decision to move forward on it, as opposed to actually having made a decision to move forward on it. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. and I guess that leads to the next question, which is what is the time period now that they have shortened to? Yeah, I think we can discuss this in closed session and for Okay. Could you uh, talk a little bit about efforts to free uh, Evan uh, Goskovich, uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter currently imprisoned in Russia? Uh, are we making any progress there? In sir, uh, uh, we are working on that. I think we can discuss that in closed session and, yeah. Which leads to my next question. Uh, there, there's a lot of public interest in it. And I've long felt that there's overclassification of information. Uh, as you know, the present system dates from, I think it's Harry Truman, executive orders in terms of classifications of different materials are, in my view, very antiquated. I've been to countless classified briefings in the SCIF, and I've read about them the next day or the previous day in the New York Times or wherever. Uh, aren't we overclassifying information? Shouldn't we be disclosing more of it? What I find, and I say it in these briefings, our adversaries know what you're telling us about them. Uh, we know, our adversaries know all about it. They know we know. The only people who don't know are the American people. Aren't we overclassifying? Yes, I, I've been very public in saying that overclassification is an issue, and it's one that we're working quite hard on. It, it is not going to be solved in the, you know, quickly because it is actually um, there are a lot of institutional issues that are at stake and challenging. And one of the things that we're doing, for example, is uh, related to the fact that. Um, we recognize we produce an enormous amount of information. Some of it gets declassified over time. It is necessary for us to get that information out. We are trying to use technology in a more productive way to actually ensure that we are doing this at a more rapid rate. And we've had some progress on this, and there's actually money in our current budget proposals to try to increase the amount of technology and work that we can do in this area to ensure that we're pushing out information that should be pushed out. We are working with our FOIA offices to basically ensure that they are better staffed, that they're in a position to be able to do more work more quickly, prioritize what is of the highest public interest. We are working through trying to ensure that we actually incentivize to the greatest extent possible accurately classifying things, not overclassifying things, et cetera. So I, I'm happy to share we've got a lot of uh, lines of effort, frankly, on this issue to try to improve the situation. Well, just one last quick question yeah. on uh, Evan Gershkowitz. Uh, are we making progress or not? I honestly, this is not an area where I am involved in the specific talks, and I would rather, yeah, leave okay. that to others. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Bud, please. Thank you, Chairman, General, Director. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, Director Haynes, the annual threat assessment, it states that the intelligence community assesses that, and a quote from there is, that Iranian leaders did not orchestrate nor had foreknowledge of the Hamas attack against Israel. So how confident are you about that assessment and to the extent that you can discuss it here? How has October 7th impacted the relationships and operations of the broader Iranian threat network? Sure, I can give a start at this, and uh, General Cruz may have more to add to. I mean, I think we're uh, reasonably confident and growing more confident over time that that assessment is correct um, with respect to their foreknowledge of the attack. And then in terms of the um, relationship um, impact that it's had, as you indicate. I think it has um, certainly increased the um, 
degree of work that is being done between, for example, Iran and the Houthis. That was obviously a longstanding relationship, but that one continues to build. And, uh, and the Houthis are increasingly relying on Iran for um, assistance in their capacity and um, uh, for weapon systems and so on, and, and to make them more uh, precise in many respects. It is certainly um, continued. I mean, I think the relationship with the uh, uh, Iranian-aligned militia groups, as we often refer to them, within the region. Um, these are classically Shia militia groups that have been working with Iran that get money, training, weapon systems, and so on from them. And, uh, and we continue to see that relationship. I don't know that it's had an enormous impact on the relationship um, uh, since October 7th, but it has been one that's been quite active, obviously, during this period, and they've been assisting in the sort of strategy that Iran has taken with respect to the conflict in the region during this period. Um, I would say that the relationship remains strong between Iran and Hezbollah um, that, you know, continues to be uh, a key partner from their perspective and um, one that they rely on to manage security in the region in many respects uh, from their perspective. And um, and I guess that's sort of a, a general waterfront landscape. Uh, if we could, I, I'm going to ask a of little course, another part to that question, Director. Uh, since October 7th, Iran has encouraged and enabled its proxies to conduct strikes against Israel and then also U.S. interests. In fact, we saw more than 100 attacks against U.S. forces in the Middle East, including the killing of three American soldiers. Those attacks have dissipated but they seem to have started again. Director, uh, what is the, the IC's assessment of whether the Iran threat network will renew a campaign of attacks against U.S. forces, or has some level of deterrence been established? And uh, Director, we'll start with you in general, if you would add in. Okay. Yeah, currently they continue to sort of be in this pause. The, the question of how long it um, will last is, you know, unknown to us. But here are some of the factors that I think are relevant to it. One is um, the Iranians have really been focused on pressuring the Iranian threat network, as you call it, the Iranian-aligned militia groups, on Israel, as you pointed out. That is sort of their primary um, instruction in many respects. And, uh, and what has really, in part been driving the Iranian militia groups in this scenario, particularly the Iraqi um, uh, groups, has been also to drive uh, U.S. forces out of the region and coalition forces out of the region, but particularly U.S. forces. And, um, and so how the talks with the High Military Commission go, how the conversation goes in Iraq, and how much Sudani is able to manage that I think President Sinai will make a difference to essentially the calculus of those groups and whether or not they initiate uh, continued attacks is um, sort of where we are on this, but we'll continue to watch that. And we do think, obviously, that the pause reflects a certain amount of deterrence that's been established during this period. But again, these factors can adjust that, and it's possible for it to start at any time as a consequence of that discussion. But please. Uh, I um, would probably just echo the point I would have made would have been the Iraqi connection and what the drivers are in the calculus of uh, the um, Iraq uh, Iranian threat network and the uh, Iranian aligned militia groups uh, and then the deterrence I think that we have seen temporarily it it is a fleeting piece and needs to be refreshed and renewed or rediscussed and it's the variables that uh, the director laid out that I think will drive that thank you Bottom line, in the interest of time, uh, could you describe the threats from Hamas and Hezbollah to the homeland, how they've evolved since October 7th, Director? Yeah, I mean, in many respects, the greatest threat that they pose to the homeland is the degree to which uh, they inspire um, folks within the homeland to conduct attacks. And also for other groups, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Al-Qaeda and ISIS have basically directed, in a sense, um, renewed uh, um, instructions to continue to go against U.S. interests. And it, so that is um, more of the impact that they're having with respect to the homeland at this point. But over time, that will develop. And, and I don't want to suggest in any way that the counterterrorism uh, concerns that we have are significant at this point. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bud. Uh, Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Haynes, uh, as you know all too well, uh, uh, rapid technological improvements like 
artificial intelligence and advanced photo editing is uh, allowing malicious actors uh, to spread uh, very sophisticated uh, deep fakes of photos, videos, auto recordings, and uh, I think one of uh, an, a notable example of, the, of that was uh, a video that was circulated in early 22 depicting uh, Ukrainian uh, President Zelensky uh, appearing to surrender uh, Russian uh, troops uh, in that deep fake. So in response to similar incidents, uh, several Fortune 500 companies have created the Coalition for Content Provenance uh, and Authenticity to address uh, these threats and to verify the origins of uh, digital con uh, content. Uh, and in support of their efforts, uh, I was pleased uh, to include a pilot program in the fiscal year 24 NDAA for the DOD to assess the feasibility of establishing content standard technologies on DOD produced and owned uh, media content, uh, which can be uh, used by malicious uh, forces. So my question for you, Director Haynes, is with, with thousands of government websites uh, containing digital content easily altered uh, by our adversaries, how concerned are you about the proliferation of deep fakes uh, and the resulting impacts on our national security? Thank you, sir. I, I'm very concerned about the proliferation of deep fakes and the capacity to use generative AI and other technologies basically to improve information uh, operations. And, and I think um, it, you know, that's true just across the board. As you indicated, uh, there was the example that we saw in the context of Ukraine. There was also a deep fake audio recording that we saw in the Slovakian uh, election, parliamentary elections that had impact. There are a variety of um, uh, examples now of uh, these types of things being produced and whether they're produced from information that is available through a government website or otherwise, frankly, they're a challenge. All right. Director Haynes, uh, I, I chair uh, the Homeland Security Committee and I'm keenly aware of the current and emerging threats uh, associated uh, with unmanned uh, aircraft uh, systems, uh, both for the homeland uh, as well as our, our uh, folks uh, abroad. And major technical, uh, technological investments are, are going to be clearly needed to uh, combat uh, uh, these risks. But just as importantly, we need to actually synchronize all of our fragmented interagency uh, efforts. So, so my question for you is, how is the intelligence community coordinating and sharing intelligence uh, with your interagency partners to mitigate uh, these UAS threats? And, and uh, in that response, if you could tell us any roadblocks that you are facing in those coordination efforts to get everybody on the same page. Thank you, sir. No, so obviously you know that the Department of Defense has a counter UAS strategy. We have nested uh, essentially um, against that. Um, our own, uh, we do these sort of um, unified uh, intelligence collection strategies, and it is intended to support that strategy. And, uh, and that is sort of how we organize ourselves to ensure that we are, in fact, supporting the work that's getting done at DOD, but also in other parts of the US government on these issues. And we really haven't encountered so much challenges in the context of interagency cooperation or sharing in this space, but more in the sense of just actually going after the problem, ensuring that we're actually getting the information that we need for supporting them, and also including uh, talking to private sector and others who may have knowledge about some of the technologies that are being used, mapping out supply chains so that we can disrupt issues, things along those lines. Good, very good. General Cruz, uh, Russian uh, disinformation efforts, uh, including attempts to influence uh, EU elections and spread har harmful uh, propaganda, are being used uh, to achieve military objectives uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine. My question for you, sir, is what specific lessons has the DIA gained from Russia's ongoing information operations? So there's probably a couple, and I think I would even add to your question to, to say, uh, what have some of our other adversaries learned from Russian uh, misinformation campaigns? I worry probably um, less about our ability to how do we detect some of these pieces, which uh, in partnership with the rest of the community, I think we're able to identify a lot of that data. The issue is how do you uh, counter it? What is the pathway by which you can authoritatively say something is fake and then provide it to the people uh, in an authoritative way? Um, the uh, the, the piece that I do worry about is what, what are the Chinese learning, what are uh, the Iranians learning, uh, what does the impact of disinformation mean on all future battle spaces or in the lead up to future conflicts, uh, which drives the need to really get our arms around um, how do we effectively and efficiently detect 
deep fakes and other pieces and have a dissemination system in the same way that we do uh, with traditional intelligence. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Peters. Uh, Director, General, thank you for your excellent testimony. Uh, we will now adjourn the open session and we will reconvene. Uh, let's shoot for 12 noon uh, in SVC 217. Uh, with that, uh, I will adjourn the open session. Thank you. <laughs>